So we put our life on pause, understandably, because of this experience is painful and we want to fix it. So if there is a way to fix it, then that's fantastic. And this is what ACT would also say, you know, you're welcome to do whatever helps to reduce your suffering and helps you to move towards more meaning and purpose. So you kind of pause your life and that includes pausing the things that, that you were doing before, which was creating meaning and purpose in your life, to try and fix this problem. And you try it for a week and you try it for a month and you try this technique and that technique on this therapy and that therapy and you keep trying them, but it keeps coming back. So you blame yourself. You say, I haven't found the right technique yet or I need to work harder. And so your life goes on pause. And so what ACT is saying, and this is the way it's kind of radically different, is that we're not going to try and fix getting rid of this pain. What we're going to do is learn the skills to make space for this physical, mental, emotional pain to be there. And we're also going to learn the skill of turning our attention back towards what was meaningful and purposeful for us. And you commit to taking these tiny, tiny, tiny steps. And what people find, amazingly, is that when you go back towards focusing on what makes your life meaningful and purposeful, you actually, you know, that, that pain that was there before doesn't seem to be there that much. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn how you can live better with PMDD, this podcast was created for you. This is Mindfulness for PMDD with Diane. I'm Diane and I'm a registered dietitian and lactation consultant. I'm also a mom, a PMDD warrior, and a trauma-informed mindfulness teacher. And this is where I discuss topics related to PMDD through the lens of mindfulness and meditation, and where I share all about how mindfulness has gotten me to a place of greater peace and acceptance with my PMDD. I also chat with people who have helped and inspired me along the way, so they can share their wisdom with you too. So let's get started. This podcast is not a substitute for psychological therapy or medical advice. Please take care when listening to this podcast, as some may find certain words or subjects triggering or difficult to hear. Take only what serves you and leave the rest behind. Shamash Aladina. Shamash is best known as the internationally best selling author of 10 books, including Mindfulness for Dummies and The Mindful Way Through Stress. He also co-founded the world's first Museum of Happiness in London and often collaborates with UK charity Action for Happiness. Based in London, Shamash runs online trainings and speaks at conferences all over the world. He's a keen educator who spent 10 years teaching mindfulness meditation as well as science in schools. And since then, he has trained almost 500 mindfulness teachers. Shamash pioneered online mindfulness teacher training launching his program, Teach Mindfulness Online, and has been training practitioners in acceptance and commitment therapy, or training, also called ACT. ACT is a cutting-edge approach that skillfully combines acceptance, flexible mindfulness, values, and committed action to help people live a rich and meaningful life. So, please enjoy my chat with Shamash Aladina. So, welcome, Shamash. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Diane. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited. So Shamash, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started with mindfulness, perhaps in your own personal journey, and then in your work and what you currently do in terms of mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapy? Sure, sure, sure. So my journey, I guess, into mindfulness started back when I was in university. I, was, I started my uh, degree in engineering when I was 18. And at age 20, I tried doing it in the summer vacation, like a, a mini job. And I got, got a decent pay packet for the first time ever. And all my life up to this point was to make money. And I thought, oh, yeah, when you spend money, that's going to really make, make, make you happy. And so finally, I'd had this money and I remember spending it. And there was this great feeling of emptiness. I was in Oxford Street in central London, actually, a typical capitalist location to spend money. And there was this great sense of emptiness there unfortunately and i thought oh i've been sold to this dream that you know you work really hard you get good grades you get a good job and then you, you know you get this money which will be your reward 
but it wasn't the reward I was expecting. And so there was this feeling of frustration. And then luckily, I saw a poster in the underground for a philosophy class. It said it was like a quote of Socrates. And I thought, yes, philosophy is the total opposite of chemical engineering. Let's, <laughs> let's just see what happens. So, so I showed up to this class and that was, they didn't call it mindfulness then, but they talked about Eastern philosophies a little. They talked about consciousness and specifically, and they said, we can have different levels of consciousness and awareness. And you've got, you know, your sleep state, which is the lowest. You've got dream states, which is slightly higher. You've got your normal waking state, which is the state that most people are in when they're on the underground or trains in London. You see they're half awake, half asleep. <laughs> um, and then they said there's exercises you can do to raise your level of awareness. This has been practiced for thousands of years, and you can learn to do these exercises. When you do them, you actually feel more present. You have you, you have more choice in your life and you feel more alive. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Okay. I was very, still very skeptical. I had my science hat on. Anyway, they did an exercise where you went through all your senses. So you went through sight and you noticed the colors and then scent, sense of smell, the touch of your body. And then what was the life-changing moment for me that that was like 25 years ago now, but I still remember, is you connect to your sense of hearing. So you listen to the further sounds and then you notice that your thoughts are just like those sounds. They're just thoughts arising and passing away, just like the sounds that you hear. Mm. And they said there's this silence that's beyond the thoughts and things. You just, you're like this observer. And these thoughts are coming up and they're going, but they're not you. They're just arising one after the other. And so you don't have to, you know, they're not necessarily true. They may or may not be true. But you, you are not that because if, if you were the thoughts, you wouldn't be able to hear them or notice them. You're, you're the, there's a part of you that's the observer of these thoughts and that's totally free of them. And they described this as, you know, that connects us all together and there's this oneness about it. And although I was very skeptical, this started to started to make sense for me I, and, and I really clicked into it and I really started to go from a kind of person who didn't care about the present moment at all, never even knew that was a concept. I was constantly planning, constantly thinking, constantly trying to be successful in whatever I was doing by planning and setting goals and all that kind of stuff to actually, hey, let's look at the clouds. Let's look at the trees. Let's just be in the moment rather than constantly trying to create this future, which may or may not be an, um, a positive place for us to be. Let's, be. let's be fully present and enjoy that. So yeah, that was the beginning of my journey, and then very briefly after that, I you know I became a school teacher where all the children also did mindfulness and meditation, and then and then in 2010 uh, this book came out, Mindfulness for Dummies, and when I print when that book came out, I decided to take the plunge and go full time into being a mindfulness teacher, and in the last 15 years I've been first of all teaching mindfulness, then training mindfulness teachers mostly online. And then I got interested in ACT as well, acceptance and commitment training. We'll probably talk a little bit more about that soon. Yeah. But I got interested in that and, and sharing that with others as well. So, yeah, that's been my journey in a nutshell. I love that. I love how you said that thoughts are just like sounds. And you are, I think you said, you are not the thoughts themselves because otherwise you wouldn't be able to notice them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you would be that thing. Right? Exactly. Exactly. That's so cool. And then I didn't realize this. This is awesome. You said that what kind of was that final thing, the push where you decided to begin teaching mindfulness was when you picked up that book, Mindfulness for Dummies? Yeah, well, and when I published it, actually. When, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You, when you published it, I thought you said you picked up Mindfulness <laughs> for Dummies. I'm like, haven't you written that book? <laughs> And then I thought, oh, well, maybe he's done, like, further versions of it. That's like a good comedy episode where you publish your own book and then you <laughs> see it in the library. And you're like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> I'm pretty good. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, maybe they have other people do future iterations or something. I was like, I've missed a step They here. sometimes wow. do. Yeah. Okay. In fact, I had read... To I had read CBT for dummies before I wrote my book. And that's when I found ah. out that these dummies books were quite good. And um, yeah. there was another one called Meditation for Dummies, which was also okay. excellent too. So and that's when oh, I got okay. into the whole dummies okay. books. <laughs> got it. Got it. 
So yes, okay, so I was right. Okay, so you've, you have published the Mindfulness for Dummies book. Yes. Without someone else having published it first. <laughs> okay, so Shemesh, of course, I, I have an understanding of ACT because I incorporate ACT principles in my program. But I'd love if you could talk a little bit for our listener and also because I would love to hear, you know, your, your perspective about mm. what is ACT and then how is ACT different from mindfulness? What's, what's ah. the same? What's different? Ah, great question. So ACT stands for Acceptance, Commitment, Training or Therapy. And that's mm -hmm. the first important thing because it's not just a therapeutic model. Like in mindfulness, there's a program called MBCT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. It's kind of designed from the ground up for, uh, as a therapeutic process. But if we, if we look at ACT and where ACT was first kind of designed and developed, it's connected to a very interesting story from one of the co-founders, Dr. Stephen Hayes. And he was suffering from a lot of kind of panic and anxiety. And all the techniques that he used, the best techniques at the time, didn't help him to overcome that panic. It just got worse and worse until, you know, he was about to call uh, an ambulance because we thought he was having a heart attack, but realized it was a panic attack. But in that night, he had... What I think he would describe as a spiritual experience. He doesn't often use that word, but he actually wrote a scientific paper on on spirituality. And it was a spiritual experience, but it was the, similar to what I described with that meditation. He became the observer of his thoughts. He became the observer of that anxiety and the panic. And he realized that because he wasn't that panic, he was the observer of it, he didn't have to act on it. But the interesting thing is then he didn't just say, okay, I've had this spiritual experience, you know, I'm going to become a guru and teach everyone this or act like this authority. He went back to the very basic science of how the brain works and behavioral science. And he created a theory, quite complicated theory called a relational frame theory, which is about how the brain works, how the human brain in particular works. And why is the human brain different to to other animals why have we got all these things all, the, all this science and all these space rockets how do we how come we can com communicate in such complicated ways the, you know, there's different theories for that and he came up with a cutting edge theory which he spent you know i think a decade or so developing and testing it's called relational frame theory and it it's a complicated theory but the simplicity of it is that human beings because of the way our brain works we can connect anything to anything so even something which might be a positive experience like watching a sunrise, if, if we'd had a, a negative experience about something that happened when you were watching the sunrise, then every time you see that, you could be reminded of that. So we have right. this ability to create suffering in the present moment by things that have happened in the past and also push it into the future as well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he did this very basic level of, of research into, into this relational frame theory and then developed it into this act. He, did, he researched it in a way that's very flexible. So rather than, you know, with mindfulness courses, you know, quite often the eight-week courses, because if they come up with this concept of an eight-week course and they try it out on a group of people, let's say, that have anxiety and they think, oh, yeah, it looks, seems like it works, and they repeat it. Mm -hmm. But it's not proven for other, process, other ways of sharing it, for example. Whereas the way ACT was researched, they found these six specific flexible, these six skills, they call them, flexibility skills uh, and if you cultivate each of these six skills it leads to a greater sense of res resilience uh, and mental well-being and a greater sense of fulfillment that you can cultivate so they didn't even really use the word mindfulness but they just did this research and they found that these six skills are flexible create cycle what is called psychological flexibility that creates resilience leads to a flourishing life and as it turns out, through their research, four out of those six skills could be considered mindful skills. Acceptance, being able to unhook from your thoughts, being the observer of your thoughts, which was what we've been emphasizing today, and being able to be flexibly in the here and now, in the present moment. Um, and then the other beautiful thing about ACT is that they provide very kind of creative ways in which you can cultivate these skills. So you know, if you like practicing meditation, great. Uh, meditation can help cultivate some or many of those skills. But then there's these other kind of quite unique, creative, unusual little techniques that could take you five, 10 seconds or 30 seconds or a minute. 
And they may sound as if they're a bit gimmicky and fun, but actually they're very well tested in the world of, of research and science. Argu- arguably, according to Stephen Hayes, they're, you know, these six skills, if you kind of cultivate and develop them, the, they are more well proven than, than any other kind of measure in psychological science to cultivate a sense of flourishing and, and build our resilience. So they're really well tested and very well accepted. You know, places like the World Health Organization recommends them. Um, and I think as time goes by, I think more and more people will be cultivating these skills because they're, they're really beneficial for us. And so you mentioned that four of the six flexibility skills can be can fall under mindfulness and they were diffusion or like separating ourselves from our thoughts and hooking from our thoughts, observing mm-hmm. and engaging with the present moment and acceptance. Can you talk about the other two flexibility skills are? Sure. Yeah. So what I like to call the fifth one is, is opening your heart to your values, a values based uh, approach to living. Cause if, we can have lots of goals in our lives, but if our goals aren't driven by our values, then when we achieve the goal, there can be a sense of emptiness and all you can think about is what's my next goal. Yeah. And I guess that's what my experience was in that moment when I, you know, money was the goal and then I made the money, I spent it, but then there was a sense of emptiness there because there was no values behind it. Like, you know, what's the meaning and purpose behind it? Right. So becoming clearer about what our values are, which is what, and this is what drives meaning. And in a way, the goal of ACT is to live a meaningful life, a purposeful life. Recently, just a few days ago, was International Day of Happiness. And I went to World Happiness Summit. And they and the, and the theme of the whole summit was about purpose. How do we live with more purpose? And they were saying that, you know, if you think of happiness just as a feeling, then it just comes and goes. It's a feeling that, you know, some days you feel happy and other days not so much. And so it's a goal that's constantly elusive. Whereas if you cultivate values-based living and connect with your values, that can give you much more resilience and can give much more meaning and purpose. So becoming clearer about your values is the fifth one. And the final one is learning to take steps to turn those values into action. So how do you set goals? And I've been learning to kind of do this more recently where you set a goal for the year, a goal for the next 90 days. I think that's quite a nice length of time to think about. And then even every month and every week. And mindfulness can often shy away from goal setting. But actually, you know, having goals to move towards can give us a sense of meaning and purpose because it Mm -hmm. turns those values into action. Right. So the final of the six flexibility skills is, is being able to set very, very, very small goals that you can achieve on a daily basis that move you towards uh, your meaningful life. Yeah. And, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, talking about moving away from your goals, moving toward your goals, and we'll get to this more in depth in a, in a few moments, but I can share that when I first was diagnosed with, well, first really postpartum PTSD in 2017 when my son was born. And then a couple of years later with PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is the condition that I, I coach on, because there was a period of time where my whole focus was, well, first kind of survival, and then it was sort of like learning to manage again. And and because I was so hooked and brought down by my thoughts and feelings, I began to have sort of this singular focus and I was moving away from my values, even if on some level I knew what they were intentionally or unintentionally, I was moving away from them because I was saying, well, I'm just going to focus on this right now, right? I'm going to focus Mm. on feeling better physically, feeling better mentally, whatever it was, survival mode. But also certain things were taken away or moved around in my life in terms of things I could or couldn't do. It felt like the things I was doing previously to take meaningful action toward my values were going away and moving me away from my values. And I think that's where Mm. a lot of grief came from. And I think that's why finding mindfulness in that kind of helped me to come back around. So just just kind of something you know, to share on that on that point. So here's what I'm wondering though, because you know, I love how you talk about the way that this theory and these skills have been 
well tested. And also you, you mentioned something about the way some other programs are maybe tested in one very specific framework or setting. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so then we, that's wonderful and that's great to know, but also then we cannot be quite so sure if we move them out of that setting or framework. And mm-hmm. so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about, I don't know, just, you know, anything you know or want to share about some of the research behind ACT and also something that I've heard you talk about in the past, which is this transdiagnostic nature of ACT, where ACT is not meant to, it wasn't studied for any one or two particular conditions or challenges, but rather can be applied in a wide variety of uh, challenges and settings. Yeah, absolutely. It's another uh, fascinating uh, part of ACT, and I think it's really interesting. Transdiagnostic, yeah. So, like you said, you know, and ACT is still tested in this way, but you take specific conditions and you you see what kind of um, modality or way of sharing ACT would be beneficial. Right. But the way the ACT is researched is that, you know, they, that's why I kind of talked about this relational frame theory at the beginning of our conversation. It's, they, they created this theory about how they believe the human brain works. And by understanding the way the human brain works, you can see that it can go in this direction would cause more suffering. And if the brain can go in this direction, it can create more meaning and purpose. So if we understand that, okay, there's these six flexibility skills. And these are skills that they've also found that we can improve upon. And if we develop these skills, we it leads to what, what they call, they've given it this fancy name, psychological flexibility. So the more we develop these six skills, the more we have psychological flexibility. And this is what gives, this helps to move us towards a life that's more meaningful. Now, what happens, and you gave a great example of that, is that we all go through dif- difficulties and challenges in our lives and barriers and things get in the way. So let's say, for example, let's continue with this example of something happens and you're feeling anxious. Okay. Through it could be through what you've shared with the PM, DD, or it could mm-hmm. be some, some other cause of it, but there's something that's causing us suffering. Mm-hmm. And so we put our life on pause, understandably, because of this experience is painful and we want to fix it. So if there is a way to fix it, then that's fantastic. This is what ACT would also say, you know, you're welcome to do whatever helps to reduce your suffering and helps you to move towards more meaning and purpose. So you you kind of pause your life and that includes pausing the things that that you were doing before, which is creating meaning and purpose in your life to try and fix this problem. And you try it for a week and try it for a month and you try this technique and that technique on this therapy and that therapy and you keep trying them, but it keeps coming back. So You blame yourself. You say, I haven't found the right technique yet, or I need to work harder. And so your life goes on pause. Yeah. And then eventually you come across a podcast by Dan. He's talking about about ACT. Okay. And acceptance and commitment training. And so what ACT is saying, and this is the way it's kind of radically different, is that we're not going to try and fix getting rid of this pain. What we're going to do is learn the skills to make space for this physical, mental, emotional pain to be there. And we're also going to learn the skill of turning our attention back towards what was meaningful and purposeful for us. And you think, oh, no, I can't do that. That's going to be so hard. I can't make space for this pain. Well, Well, you say, okay, let's look at what you've been doing for the last few weeks, months, years, decades. Do you want to continue doing that? And, you know, you're welcome. And it's not said in a, in a bad way or negative way, but, you know, I guess you have a choice. You can continue and you may think you may have this hope that, that you may find something that works that will fix it. But maybe it's now time to try something different. And so very sl- in very small steady steps, you get you, you taught mindfulness skills. And these, you could call them mindfulness skills. If you don't like the word mindfulness, you can call it, you know, Skills for making space, skills for being present, skills for being open, skills for being able to turn your attention to something else. And so you learn these different skills. Some of them you may have come across. Some of them are quite creative and unique. And I'm sure maybe Diane's talked about some of these techniques. And so you start to create some space between you and your thoughts, between you and these painful thoughts or these painful feelings. And then once you start to get that little bit of room, you use that space to start turning towards 
ah, yes, I used to love this particular hobby, or I used to love connecting with, say, friends. These friends have lost touch with, so let me set this tiny goal of texting one of them. And, you know, there'll be some fear and reluctance. So you use these other skills to help you to overcome those fears, or you work with your coach or your therapist or through a book, whatever. And you start moving in that other direction. And so what, what this act is about, acceptance and commitment, it's about learning the skill of acceptance. That's not a great word for a lot of people. So you could think of yeah. it as openness, opening up space for it, or making room, you could call it. So you can call it making room and commitment therapy. So you yeah. make room <laughs> for what, what, what you're struggling with, and you commit to taking these tiny, tiny, tiny steps and what people find, amazingly, is that when you go back towards focusing on what makes your life meaningful and purposeful, you actually, you know, that, that pain that was there before doesn't seem to be there that much. Mm -hmm. But that's not the goal. But even if the pain is just as much there or even more, it's this, this approach is saying, let's make space for that and let's keep moving towards what makes our life meaningful. And, you know, 99% of the time it does tend to, because your attention is not there, your attention is on what makes your life fulfilling and full of purpose. Yeah. Um, and then maybe, you know, and then you start to be, have more creativity and you can think of more solutions to your challenges. So that's why it's radically different. Why it's trans diagnostic, it doesn't, so if it was for anxiety, we're not saying your anxiety would go down. If it was for low mood, and you're using ACT, your, your low mood may, may go up and down. What we're focusing is on our actions. That's what ACT is saying is that that's something that we do have some control over. We don't have much control at all on thoughts or feelings or bodily sensations, but what we do have more control on is what makes our life meaningful. There's much more control there. So it helps you to accept, make space for what you can't control and take action on what you can control. And that's why it's so unique and uh, that's why I think we both enjoy sharing it because it makes a lot of sense and it's quite empowering as well. Hey, PMDD friend. If you want to be the first to know when a new episode is coming out, head to the show notes to join the Mindfulness for PMDD email list. I'll send you a heads up when I've scheduled a new episode to be published. I'll also give you sneak peeks at topics I'm working on and guests that I've booked. And maybe you can even submit your requests and suggestions for upcoming episodes. Get on the list at the show notes below this episode. You know, this part about how the goal of ACT is, is not symptom reduction and yet there are many people who have found that as they do find themselves able to focus more on their values and and on taking meaningful action to live more in line with their values somehow there is some relief of whatever that symptom is or that challenge is maybe you know some sort of alleviation and i even found that for myself and i'm still really blown away by it um, wow. It's wild to experience because, you know, for me, my kind of real life version of it is that I got to a place where I had tried so many things. I felt like I had exhausted the list of things a person can do in terms of self management and treatment. And I ticked all the boxes and still I was having a very difficult time. And what I noticed was, what I learned was, as much symptom relief as I could experience, one, my condition goes on, and it's going to fluctuate, no matter what I do, it will fluctuate, and it will throw surprises at me sometimes. And two, life will go on, and life will throw curveballs at me. And what I learned was, no matter how, like, air quotes, good, I got or felt, there were going to be bad times. And my response to those bad times was with a lot of resistance and mm. anger and resentfulness. And so my whole response was fighting, fighting, fighting. And you're right. As you say, like my whole energy, my whole attention was focused on like, how do I fight this? What else can I throw at this? What else am I not doing that I should be doing to make it better? And that's what started to bring my focus away and my actions and my time away from, th from things that were important to me. And it makes sense because when we're feeling badly, 
we want to try to feel better. We want to try to do everything we can do. We do turn to that like instinct to survive, right? And then mm. if we can get past that, to thrive. But when I, and I felt that resistance to the word acceptance, but when I was able to say, okay, let me, let me at least give this a try. Let me see if I can be more open or more willing or just make that little bit of space. The more I did that, the further down that path I went. And not to say that that's a path that you're always going forward on in one direction. Because maybe sometimes you feel a little less willing or a little less open. But the more I was able to practice this, actually, the more symptom relief I did begin to feel. And that was shocking. And to this day, it's still shocking. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Powerful mm-hmm. personal experience that you've got there. Powerful. That, that, that it works. Yeah. And it works in and a way that it's not about fixing, which is the amazing thing. Yes. Right. Because that wasn't even the point or the focus. Yeah. And even more powerful when I start to read some of these research papers and see that, you know, that's an actual that's an actual observation, you know, kind of printed in this research paper, you know, like, this is not the point, but this can be a byproduct. You're not the only one who's had that experience, you know, yeah, to see that yeah. in writing, like, what? <laughs> but the, the really interesting thing is that if we're doing it from the perspective that this is going to get rid of the feelings, this is going to get rid of the thoughts, yeah. then then it doesn't work so well. Yeah. So it yeah. has to be has to be because your mind knows the tricks that your mind is playing on yes. itself. It, it knows what's going on. <laughs> so yeah. So yes. but what I what because acceptance is so kind of difficult and and everyone is so kind of reluctant to do it pretty much. Yeah. What I like to do is to break it down, make it really small. So okay, think of acceptance as a sliding scale, mm-hmm. zero to hundred percent. Could you be one percent more accepting of it and just notice what that feels like? Yeah. Or can you be 100% accepting for just 10 seconds or five seconds yeah. or for one second? So you really, really break it down to super tiny um, bits and then think of it like that. And just to experiment, you, you know, you can be playful yes. with it and experiment with it and see what yeah. happens. Everyone's allowed to do that. You can even do that with values. You can take a value and you can experiment with it. See, okay, I think my value is creativity. Let me try doing something in a creative way and see, if, see, what, see what happens. So we can be flexible in the way we apply this approach too, but we can apply it to acceptance. So call it making room, making space, mm-hmm. allowing, yeah, find the word that works for you and see the tiniest, tiniest minimum dosage that you can do, which can be down to one second or a split second, and it could be a, a fraction of 1% acceptance yeah. and start there. Start there. That's quite a fun thing to do. Yeah. I love that. I love that sort of practical kind of tip or view. And I want to continue down sort of a more kind of practical path because we did, I think we did jump in a little bit more with the science, but I, I think I wanted to kind of lay a foundation and make sure that, you know, anyone listening has an un- understanding of what we're talking about. We're not just throwing around words like act, <laughs> you know, yes. but I do want to kind of apply this more to real life situations and particularly because my audience is either living with this condition PMDD or has some interest in it for one reason or another. And so in that case, you know, what we're dealing with is we've got this, you've got a chronic debilitating condition and it's cyclical, cyclical. So it's coming and going. And even though you pretty much have a sense of when it's going to come back around and when they're going to be feeling pretty miserable and when it's going to go away again, it still can throw you surprises from month to month, week to week, day to day, and really can throw a lot of, a wide variety of symptoms at you. So they can be psychological, they can be physical, they can be cognitive. So for many people, it even affects their work, their ability to work the way they previously or They might feel really incompetent because of things like brain fog and decreased executive function and things like that. And so because it really can affect every area of your life, there can be a lot of feeling of losing oneself, losing your feeling of your identity, or feeling like your life no longer resembles what what it used to or what you hoped it would, 
and I mentioned like for me, there was a lot of resentment, resistance, just trying to fight, 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 fight. And so I'm wondering if we can explore a little bit more about how something like ACT could potentially benefit someone who could be going through something like this, you know, whether it's something like the MDD or some other condition where you really feel like suddenly your your life's almost been like, like, like the puzzle's just been kind of like thrown up in the air and all the pieces are everywhere and you just feel like, I'm never going to be able to get this back together. I've got lost pieces. I don't know what's happening anymore. I can't even identify what the image was. You know, like how yeah. how could we per- possibly apply ACT to something like that to potentially, you know, get the benefits of it? Yeah, yeah. So it's a really challenging situation. Um, and, you know, if you can find someone to work with you through the ACT, the, you know, ACT coaching or, or therapy or something like that, then that would be ideal. But in addition to that, you could think about, you could, you could read a book on ACT, you can go through those, the six flexibility skills. And maybe in the days or weeks where things are a little bit easier for you, cultivating some of the skills that you can mm-hmm. cultivate the, you know, being open skill and you could maybe do, See what you can do. Maybe you can do a few minutes of of uh, mindfulness, like mindful acceptance, and you can practice it. So you, you're you're building up the skills when the times are not so challenging. Yeah, you can learn about the diffusion or unhooking, and you can practice unhooking certain thoughts and, and learning to create some space between you and the thoughts. You can learn to be this observer self, this transcendent self. You can see yourself in this different context with that third uh, mindful skill. You can do everyday mindfulness like you can practice when you go for a walk, feeling your feet on the floor, noticing the breeze of the air against your skin, looking at the colors around you, trying to take just a breath or two or three breaths every now and then so you're not rushing so much everywhere. So you're going through all these different skills and you're developing them and you're starting to get a little, little bit better at them. And so then when you, when you meet of the peak of your challenge, then maybe you'll have some of that opening available to you from the skills that you developed. Another thing you could do is you could take a sheet of paper and write down the skills that you find helpful or the exercises that you think would work well for you or you've tried to exercises you've tried that you kind of quite like. And then look back at that at, at a time when you're going through the challenge. And in the mix with all this stuff that we've been talking about, I would say self-compassion is also a huge one. You know, when we're going through a difficult time, we, we can be very harsh on ourselves where it's not really your fault. You've been, you know, you found yourself in this situation where everyone would find challenging. So maybe you could use some, find some words of self compassion that resonate with you. You can put that on this piece of paper too, something that you look at. Or you could do some small two, three minute self compassion exercises or write a self compassion letter, something that can help you tap into that self compassion when you're at the peak of that challenging time but also you know it might involve the certain people there might be that you can reach out to and talk to and that you know that you that would be kind of compassionate towards you that might be a helpful approach calling someone texting someone maybe you'll have two or three of their names on this piece of paper so putting together i guess some resources maybe even a box where there's some nice scent that can help you connect with the present moment some messages that you have for yourself and maybe there's a little booklet or a little book that you really like. That's what comes to mind is almost like a resource that you have to support yourself, to encourage you to connect with others or connect with yourself in, in a mindful and kindful way at these kind of moments of difficulty and challenge and and just connecting with community as well. So with yourself listening to this podcast and the community around this and other communities like that, just to remind yourself that you're not so isolated and alone as well because that can – I'm sure it feels quite isolating when you go through these experiences and knowing that there's others out there that have managed to work through it successfully or that can help you with it. That can be, that can feel really important as well. And with social animals, so social connection is super important. Yes. Uh, so that, that can make a big difference too. There, there's some of the yeah. ideas that comes to mind. No, I, I love that. And in particular, I really love your idea of finding days or weeks that are easier in which to practice these skills and exercises because so the program that I have is a mindfulness and acceptance 
coaching program for people going through PMDD. And what I have found personally and what I try to apply in my program is this idea that like one good thing about PMDD, kind of shocking to say that this is a good thing about PMDD, but a good thing about PMDD is that because it's cyclical, we have a good idea of when we're going to go back into the time that we feel good. And what I found in my own experience was that, yes, certain things were really hard to practice or to get going as a habit when I was in the really bad days. But if I could find a way to anchor them to some other habit or just create a reminder for myself, then in the good days, I could start to practice those skills and like, you know, hone those skills, maybe create a habit and slowly be able to start applying them during the more challenging times. And so I did find that really powerful and a really good trick. And so I do try to apply that now in my program. And so I I love that one. And yes, self-compassion is super important because it's it's easy to kind of blame yourself or feel like you're failing. And so to to kind of find a way to reconnect with that self-compassion is can really go a long way so shamash i i'm mindful of time i could i could listen to you talk forever and i and i do because i'm obsessed with your podcast (laughs) Um, thank you (laughs) however i do i do want to to wrap us up i'd like to ask you though if you've got anything one anything in particular new going on that you'd like to share with the listener and two where people can find you so uh, I haven't shared this on any other podcast, but actually I've written a little book of apps that I haven't, uh, I haven't kind of launched it at all. I've just, just quietly put it out there. It's uh, called The Little Book of Acts. My eyeballs are popping out of my head. My eyeballs <laughs> are popping out of my head with excitement. Okay, say the title again. I'm sorry. It's, it's a nice small book. It's called The Little Book of Acts. And the way I've structured it is it's, I think, 21 chapters. And each of them, they go through the flexibility schools. They introduce you to the main principles of ACT and then they help you kind of turn ACT into action. And each chapter's then got a, a story or a metaphor that goes with it. Mm-hmm. And I've taken the effort to create new metaphors and new new ideas because I've quite often hear the same metaphors again and again. And they're great mm-hmm. metaphors, but sometimes people have heard them too many times. So I've um, one of my challenges was to okay let me put something together in a unique way which might might help people might might make it click a bit easier so yeah it's called a little bit of a book of act and it is uh, quite small and so something that you know you could that could be part of a, a resource potentially uh, for for oneself if one want going through a difficulty or a challenge you could read a little bit or a few sentences and that can help yeah. so yeah so that that's that's out there and then if you I'm thinking about act as well I also created a coloring book on act <laughs> quite a while back so if you like to do some mindful coloring in and then the quotations are act principles so they're different kind of little quotes based on act i can't remember what it's called actually probably act coloring book but i'll have to look it up and then you have a look oh yeah, oh, yeah. It's called empower yourself it's called empower yourself which is uh, empower yourself. Which i like that concept yeah empower yourself accept is commitment right. therapy coloring book so there's some nice, easy kind of simple resources. And then the next thing up would be a mindfulness challenge that I've got on my website. It's like a free 31 day mindfulness challenge. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the overlap of mindfulness and act. Yeah. And then, you know, if you want to go into it more, then I've got a, a six week act course that you can do online as well. You can get in touch with me on my website. I can let you know what the link is for that if you want to go through it into a bit more depth. But yeah, just like you, I'm very passionate about ACT. So it's really yeah. fun talking to you uh, about it because I often get uh, to talk to other colleagues about it. So it's fun that, that you applied it both personally in your life and then you're helping yeah. this amazing uh, community of people to, to help them to overcome their challenge around PMDD. And I love your the idea that you're bringing mindfulness and acceptance and, and you're so passionate about it. So, yeah. I am and you sparked thank that you. passion. So thank you. Oh, wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. That's wonderful. So, Shamash, I will include all of this in the show notes. And so I just want to thank you again, because you you are coming to us from London, and I'm in Austin. And we mentioned before the recording, we do have a a time difference, and we have some technical difficulties. So I appreciate (laughs) you making the time and hanging in there with me. I, I feel 
very, it's been an honor and a privilege. And I am not, I mean it when I say that. So thank you so much. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Beautiful questions. And I think what you're doing is amazing. So I really appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Shamash. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked the show, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For links to everything mentioned in this episode, you can check out the show notes. And you can find me, Diane Jesus, on Instagram at Mindfulness for PMDD. Now, I invite you to pause, take a breath, and look around. <laughs>